talk today about a computational methods for IPMS data and uh, protein interaction data, but I'll actually be more uh, general than that. I'll talk about uh, a computational methods for mass spectrometry data as well, um, not only in the context of IPMS data, because I realized that there would be a, a lot of things that uh, related to IPMS data would, they, would be covered already um, by other speakers. So I have this very busy slide here that kind of outlines um, uh, many steps in uh, APMS data. Uh, many of the steps already described. Um, uh, so what I'll t talk about, uh, not about obviously the affinity purification itself and mass spectrometry, but um, going downstream, uh, the, the next step in the process is peptide and protein identification. And so far in most presentations today, it was just mentioned as something that's um, that's done as a part of the process, but I think it's important to realize different computational challenges associated with uh, mass spectrometry data processing and how they affect um, 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 the, the final results in the context of protein protein interactions as well. So I'll talk about both uh, peptide and protein identifications and implications of the protein inference problem um, on APMS data. Uh, the next step is uh, quantification, and um, in my talk again today, I'll focus more on the label frequentification. Uh, no need to introduce that. It was done nicely by Mike Washburn and others. Um, and then um, how we generate um, APMS um, bait prey quantitative matrices based on this label frequentification. And then the next step is how to actually go and assign confidence scores to individual, individual protein interactions. Um, based on APMS data. Um, and specifically, I'll focus on, um, on the part that deals with assigning confidence to individual interactions, and I'll com come back to that point. But there is a lot of uh, literature on computational methods for developing tools for kind of global um, studies, such as uh, East uh, Tandem Affinity Purification Studies that utilize network topology properties. So one may think that, well, there are so many tools for clustering and uh, confidence scores for protein-protein uh, interaction data. I would say that uh, probably 1% of, or maybe 0% of those tools actually applicable to the data that you're generating here and the data that were presented. So that's really important to remember that. Um, and also um, kind of at the end, I'll mention a little bit about some of the novel things that we're doing in terms of clustering of protein complexes. Again, um, not in the context of uh, large networks, but more in the local, local networks. Um, and I'll put it here, this kind of, at all these steps um, down there, uh, there is a uh, functional genomics data that can be utilized as a way to assist in the process um, or um, at least to annotate some of those complexes. Um, um, I think um, for everything that I'm going to be talking today, we're not going to be using functional genomics data at all because the goal of this part kind of up to here is to really ge get our confidence in protein-protein traction networks and complexes based on mass spectrometry data because the moment we start coupling existing literature or functional genomics data as a way to reinterpret the experiment-specific data, things get a little bit complicated. So I think it's good to divide things into steps and then say, first, we're not going to use any existing knowledge and try to get to this part, and then later one can integrate these different data types rather than try to utilize functional genomics data um, you know, early on in the process, although we are exploring different ways of doing that. So um, this is obviously no need to do this introduction. I only want to say that in today's presentation, um, like um, on Claude Jean Grau already mentioned, um, we'll focus on a single uh, tag purification because it provides improved sensitivity. However, it comes to the cost of uh, many more contaminants. So really, the computational methods to identify those contaminants and remove them uh, become more um, crucial for the quality of the results. Um, again, I work with the data that um, um, I can get and uh, that my collaborators are generating. And um, a lot of times it's uh, LTQ data and no labeling, although I should say that my interest in this area of protein interactions actually came from collaboration with uh, Jeff Ranish, who spoke earlier, and that was uh, uh, stable isotope labeling based uh, work. Um, uh, more recently, I started working with uh, labeling free methods such as spectral counting, um, and I'll talk mostly about that today. And again, local networks rather than versus uh, global uh, networks. So let me talk a little bit uh, next about the steps uh, that are really important in the process of how we identify peptides and proteins. And again, when I talk about this, I'll talk about 
uh, from an angle of APMS data, protein traction data. Um, although many steps are, um, are general, regardless of what you're doing. So, um, so this step of uh, peptide protein identification consists of, um, again, several sub-steps. The first one is to identify peptides um, from MSMS spectra by searching databases, which is done using computational tools such as Sequest and MESPITS they already mentioned. Uh, the next step is uh, assignment of confidence scores to all peptide identifications produced by the search engines. But that's not the end of the story here, because when we have this list of peptides and confidence scores, the next step is to assemble peptides into proteins and to infer what proteins were in the sample before trips and digestion. Um, and I call that protein inference problem. And it's shown on this panel here on the left, uh, where we have peptides connected to proteins, and we need to calculate protein level confidence scores, but also portion peptides that are shared across multiple proteins. And that becomes really tricky in the case of high eukaryote organisms where many peptides are present in multiple entries, whether it's a splice, alternative splicing, uh, or just a homology that causes this. So um, about this uh, shotgun protein, uh, proteinification uh, from the perspective of peptide and proteinification and data analysis, it's important to remember, like I just said, that we work with, with, uh, uh, with data on different levels. I think, um, okay, use this one. That we have um, uh, the protein level, that's where we usually start, right, prior to trypsin digestion. That brings us down to the peptide level, followed by mass spectrometry to generate MSMS spectra. And then the first computational step is to identify peptides and then filter out false positive peptide assignments to spectra and then to assemble peptides into proteins, uh, the peptide uh, to protein grouping. So the first step, I'll go very briefly because it's, I think by now it's very well understood uh, and we have a really good way of dealing with this. Um, so we know the problem. The problem is that all search engines um, assign a peptide to a spectrum that you, uh, that you provide to the engine um, and a lot of spectra are incorrect. And there are many reasons why there are incorrect peptide assignments. And if you're not careful, they can uh, propagate into protein, false positive proteinifications and then false positive uh, protein interactions that way. Uh, but I think by now we have a really uh, good understanding of how to filter data um, and how to assign um, individual confidence scores to peptide identifications as well as to calculate global false discovery rates. So this slide, if someone wants to learn more about this, um, there is a review paper that I wrote a few years ago um, uh, with Olga Vidak and Rui Ibersold. Um, and it just shows uh, kind of the general approaches for calculation of false discovery rate, rates in mass spectrometry-based experiments. And simply, uh, when you talk about global error rates, they can be divided into two approaches. Uh, the simpler one uh, is based uh, just on target decoy database searching, where you uh, say take a decoy database, append to the, um, to the, to the database of uh, sequences from the organism of interest, searching instead combined database, and then you um, have a list of peptides and proteins, and you count how many identifications above a certain threshold are decoys. And then based on the decoy count, you can assume that an equal number of false positives you have that are matching to the uh, forward sequences, and you estimate your error rate that way. That's so-called target decoy strategy. So we developed a method um, that, that goes beyond that simple counts and can also do an error rate estimation without actually having decoy database, uh, decoys in the database that you search. So a peptide profit, profit is one of the methods that implement uh, this strategy. Um, and uh, I'll talk about peptide profit in one slide after that. Uh, but the advantage of statistical uh, methods for computing uh, confidence scores compared to the simple target decoy methods is that we not only can estimate the global error rates, the global false discovery rates in the data set, but also we can calculate the confidence score in each individual peptide identification. And then using that probability, we can calculate the error rate for the entire data set. So there are uh, many advantages of doing this, uh, this type of analysis. So uh, here is the, the idea behind peptide profit. And a lot of tools use, use um, not only peptide profit, but other tools implemented utilize this concept one way or another. So the idea is that you take the whole database, uh, data set of all spectra that you generated in your experiment, 
search them against the database. Then for each spectrum, you have a best matching peptide in the database with a certain score. And you want to know, you know, what is the probability that, you know, for this spectrum, this is the best peptide in the database that can explain it. Given the score, what is the probability that this is a true identification? So the method that we used is based on a mixture modeling approach where we plot the histogram of all scores for the whole data set. And then we feed that observed histogram uh, using a mixture modeling approach uh, where we feed basically distribution of incorrect identifications shown in dashed green and correct and dashed red curve. And by doing that, we can map now this arbitrary search score into a posterior probability that identification is correct. So if um, the search score is somewhere around 1.5 on this plot, it means that it's a 50% probability that it's a correct identification. And if you go to a higher scores, uh, the probability that it's correct goes to one, and in the lowest scoring um, portion of the histogram, the probability is zero. So that's the general idea behind peptide profit. In a, in a recent work, we extended it substantially in the last few years. It's a very complicated slide. I realized that I just want to mention here without going into details that now this peptide profit uh, tool for processing mass spectrometry data can combine um, a target and decoy database search uh, with the statistical modeling of peptide profit in a uniform strategy. It utilizes a lot of different information, not only the search scores that are just used for illustration here, but also the mass accuracy, uh, the uh, peptide uh, separation coordinates, such as retention time or isoelectric focusing, uh, uh, other properties of peptides, such as the triptych uh, uh, status of the peptide. If you use trypsin to digest proteins, you know that you expect to see only triptych peptides. So if you do an unconstrained database search, then you obviously want to penalize all non-triptych containing uh, non-triptych non peptides. So uh, instead of using empirical thresholds uh, for each different sc uh, score here, we have, a, like I said, a uniform model that integrates all this different information, computes the probability for each peptide assignment to a spectrum, and that can go to the next level analysis uh, to do a FDR assessment as well as to the protein level module that would assemble peptides into proteins and would calculate protein level scores. So um, just to show to Mike Washburn, uh, who is still using the, uh, the basic filtering thresholds, um, uh, I don't know what one would need to do to convince you that you can easily get you know, 50, 60, if not 100% more of your data if you go and uh, do a probability-based filtering instead of this. But it didn't uh, hurt Mike. I know he's getting really great papers published. This is lousy method, so um, <laughs> um, I mean, this is not Mike's method. This is, uh, are you still using that? I'm sorry I'm embarrassing you here, but uh, I think this was like the very first method that John Yates. That would do with more spectral counts is the problem. Right, well, I'm, I'm, I wonder when I said lousy, I only refer to this part. I'm, I'm like, um, it's, it's really terrific work we should doing with the spectral counting. I'm only, this is the trivial step for you. I'm just saying that you, you can gain a whole lot if you, uh, if you, if you if you go beyond that. So, um, so the peptide profit is a tool that allows you kind of to standardize this analysis a little bit and take the, the data from whatever the instrument you use, no matter what search tool you use to analyze the data. Um, before this, you know, that it's hard to compare the data sets. The search scores are arbitrary. The error rates are not uh, known uh, by processing using statistical methods. You get to the point where they can compare the data sets easily and uh, estimate the error rates, um, which is certainly an advantage. Um, Although, um, so, but to conclude this part, um, I think that the peptide identification part is more or less well understood now and extensive work has been done. The, a lot of work is going on to really um, optimize it for a new technology such as different fragmentation mechanisms, ETD and HCD and so on. And high mass accuracy data is certainly something new. Um, but a really future direction is I think is the, there is complete absence of standardization for PTM analysis, in particular phosphoproteomics. And um, um, Akilesh Penny just talked about phosphoproteomics. And um, it's really, you know, the, the problem such as localization of the, of, this, of, of the phosphorylation is a really big issue. And uh, molecular and cellular proteomics is one of the leading journals in, in the field. Is really uh, uh, working on the guidelines for authors. You know, what do you, how do you actually describe your PTM data, not to mislead the, uh, mislead the community in terms of the um, the way how the data is presented. So I think it, it's really, in terms of the peptidification and localization, 
and force for stuff in general, that's probably would say where there is more work needs to be done. Coming back to the protein part here, uh, first uh, one can think that, well, after you get a peptide list and we know the, the confidence in peptides, it's a trivial step to go and calculate the protein confidence, right? You kind of sum up the evidence from all peptides. Um, it turns out to be really non-trivial, and I'll, um, I'm not going to go into details of this because, um, again, it's described. But there are two issues that I just want to mention in a higher level, kind of, that there is a, this non-random grouping of peptides, and I have one slide in this, next one. And there is a protein inference problem um, of the shared peptides that I already mentioned. And both of them have implications for APMS data, that's why I'm mentioning them here. So the non-random grouping of peptides, and you'll see how it's related to APMS data later, or any large-scale data set for that matter, is that even if you have a really perfect statistical analysis at the level of peptide assignments to spectrum, and say you get a data set where you have, like in this simple illustration, you have 10 spectra, uh, so you have 10 peptide identifications, and say you error rate that the peptide level is 30%, meaning that three peptide identifications here are false positives, right? So it's a three out of 10, 30% error rate. But the problem is that um, mass spectrometry is not a random process. It's a, it's a really combination of many things. So the identification of correct identifications is not random but abundance-driven process, right? That's where the whole this concept of spectral counting comes from. The more spectra you have, the higher the abundance of the protein. But that also means that all or you know, many of your correct peptide identifications, in fact, can come from the same protein. So like in this illustration, out of seven correct peptides, um, they all came from just two proteins, maybe the most abundant proteins in the sample, like in this, this is just an illustration. Um, and incorrect identifications, they are se semi-random matches to the database, corrected for the length of the protein and also for the homology. That's kind of underappreciated um, um, contribution to the, uh, to the randomness here. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but it's, it's an important point as well. It's not just length-dependent uh, process. So, um, because the databases are typically much larger than the number of uh, uh, proteins that we identify, a lot of uh, peptides match to different entries in the database if they are incorrect matches. So that leads to the um, inflation in the error rates at the peptide at the protein level. Like in this example, the error rate from the 30% of the peptide level goes to 60% of the protein level, right? So you see how um, you know, immediately there is a problem because of this non-random, what they call non-random grouping of peptides. So um, I'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, so for the shared peptide, um, that's not a computational problem, but it's really a, a, a combination of the it's really a you know, biological problem, uh, fundamentally, that you have a peptide uh, that's present in several different entries in a database and several different proteins. Um, what conclusion do we make uh, if we identify this peptide and say that's the only peptide we have for these two proteins? Is it protein A or protein B or both proteins that are present in the sample? And really, when we digest proteins with strips and other enzymes, the connectivity between peptides and proteins is lost. So we cannot really use molecular weight information or anything else to really say that it's A versus B. So that's where um, um, there is an ambiguity in uh, data interpretation. And it does have implications for APMS data as well. So the tool that we developed is called Protein Profit that attempts to deal with both of these problems. Uh, so it takes the list of peptides and probabilities computed by peptide profit and assemble peptides into proteins. Um, in doing so, it calculates the protein probability for each protein based on the initial peptide probabilities. But also for peptides that are portioned among multiple proteins, like this peptide one is present in A and also in C, it tries to split um, its weight across uh, these corresponding proteins. Um, so. It's a probability-based method that aims at deriving the minimum list of proteins that can explain all peptides. So we call it the Occam's razor approach. So what we show the biologists at the end is the, the kind of the non-redundant minimum set of proteins sufficient to explain all peptides. So for example, a peptide, uh, a protein that's not necessary, like uh, um, I would say protein B here is not really necessary to be in the sample because all peptides can be explained by uh, a combination of other proteins. Now, um, why am I talking about this now in the context of IPMS data? Is that because I really, the tools that we developed and thought 
were really great and working fine a few years ago, I realized that they are starting, start, starting breaking apart in terms of the model assumptions when we really push the envelope and uh, apply them to a very large data sets. And IPMS data are often, by definition, large data sets uh, because you take multiple baits if you want to profile a network, a large network. You basically select a lot of uh, baits and you do it in replicates. Um, and often you have negative controls. So you, you, you are dealing kind of with multiple repeated measurements of the system. You know, of course, they're not the same bait. Uh, but a lot of baits are interconnected. So oftentimes you're basically collecting more data on a small sub subset of the proteins than um, what would happen in a typical uh, mud pit experiment where you take a cell line, digest it, and analyze. And I'll come back to that and introduce a new concept of what I call over-sequencing. Um, but here is the thing that um, I want to mention on this slide, that there are different statistical methods that would take this peptide, uh, individual peptide data, and combine and compute the protein level score. The simple one would be just to say, well, let's take the best peptide, and this is our protein level score. Or one can say, well, regardless of the peptide probabilities, as long as it passes a certain threshold, we simply count how many peptides we have and apply a number of peptide uh, thresholds, say, we require that the protein is identified by two or three or more peptides. Or there are Poisson-based methods that try to uh, take the number of peptides and model it and calculate the p-value. And finally, there are methods that I call combined peptide evidence, including protein profit that basically says, well, there is an equation that can take individual peptide probabilities and compute the protein level score by combining the evidence from them. So, um, so when, uh, so, and, and we extensively tested this part here, and a lot of people are using protein profit. But when we start looking at the uh, really large scale data sets that are generated now in the context of uh, many studies, especially, like I said, label frequentification using spectral counting or data repositories such as Peptide Atlas database, for example, uh, that was mentioned by, um, by Jeff, uh, or interactome mapping APMS, like I said. Uh, really, our definition of what used to be large scale, which is you know, tens of thousands of MSMS spectra, now changes to the millions of spectra. And uh, we have to really revisit now the statistical models that we have. And my group is actually doing that. So we went back to this, what I thought was um, quite a done deal in a way. And this is where they realized that there is this a really, uh, well, that's not a novel concept, this, the situation curve that we typically see, that as we collect more and more data here, um, the number of proteins that are identified actually doesn't grow linearly, obviously. It's, uh, clearly start saturating, right? And at some point, collecting more data doesn't really identify you more proteins, especially if you use the same um, uh, technology to collect data. Um, so this regime is kind of what I call under-sequencing, where you know, collecting more data makes sense because we have more and more proteins identified. And this is clearly over-sequencing, where we collect more and more data, uh, and we maybe we get more peptides per protein, but we're certainly not getting more proteins identified. So I think that APMS data actually, depending on the type of the data sets, can be anywhere between here and here. Certainly, if you have a few pull-down experiments, you'll be somewhere in this regime where um, you, know, you can obviously identify more proteins by taking um, uh, completely unrelated baits and you know, adding to the initial analysis, and the number of proteins will grow. But a lot of APMS data sets that I recently looked actually seriously in this regime, especially if you study a protein complex or a really a, a local network with many interrelated baits. So they pretty much pull down the same set of interactors, uh, no matter what uh, protein you use as a bait. So what happens then is that as you collect more and more data, then these proteins that are true interactors, they keep um, getting more and more peptides, which is great. Um, but you start accumulating more and more false positives because each time you collect a new data set and add to the existing one, you let more and more false positives in the system in a way. So, um, so we sometimes even arrive in a case like this where um, this over-sequencing where we really got excellent coverage for all um, proteins that we really have in the sample that's the true interactors and common contaminants. Uh, but we keep collecting data, so we even for some of the false positives, you know, we start uh, false positive proteinification to start getting multiple peptides. So we are now completely redesigning some of the methods specifically for uh, the spectral counting based methods and APMS methods that can be more accurate here. And I can tell you, 
Uh, this is uh, not published yet, but we found that the simplest thing that's actually worked really well is to take the, instead of using all this com combined evidence methods, take the best peptide per protein and use its score as a, as a way to filter the data. And we find that in the case of, in this over-sequencing type of data sets, that actually works as a best, um, best score, best protein level score for filtering out false positives. Anyways, to conclude this part is that's really, uh, we have to revisit a lot of things that I thought were more or less uh, understood um, because in the large scale data sets, we encounter this over sequencing problem and many existing tools, computational tools were developed for smaller data sets and tested on smaller data sets. And what matters with large data sets, um, it's my, my observation now that's not the number of peptides at all, but how good the best peptide is. So this is actually counterintuitive and goes against some of the data publication guidelines, including the MCP guidelines. And like I said, APMS data sets range from kind of under sequencing to over sequencing in this case here. Um, so I'll talk about this part now um, in the remaining of the, the presentation, maybe one, one minute on this part here. So I talked to you how we um, collect data and hopefully arrive at the list of proteins and confidence scores so that we can filter that uh, list um, uh, efficiently with good discrimination, meaning we can eliminate false positives well. And also we have um, a posterior probabilities calculated for each protein um, as well as the global false discovery rates esti estimated. So what do we do next? Um, and this is, uh, uh, Again, uh, Mike Washburn and um, Claude and Gray and others already presented this part really nicely. And you can see that I stole some of the little things here from uh, Claude's uh, slide, um, but revise it substantially enough that maybe it's not obvious. Um, so, so this is the label-free part um, that I don't want to talk much about because, uh, again, Mike already introduced that. Um, I'll talk about some of the other things here but before I do that, I really want to mention that, again, it's in my experience that I really, we need a different computational approach depending on what type of data that we have. Uh, there is no kind of a, a uniform computational approach that works in all cases. So I already mentioned this large scale studies uh, by Krogan and um, uh, Gavin and others um, on global intractomes, and mostly these are uh, East studies. And and they're large scale and kind of old protein type of uh, studies where there is no really preference for a particular uh, type of proteins. Where there could be medium scale studies like the uh, East kinome that um, Anclaude talked about where it's, uh, it's a still a large scale study. It's uh, hundreds of baits, but it's uh, uh, selected based on certain uh, properties of those proteins like kinases and phosphatases. And small scale studies, this probably more of what uh, Mike Washburn talked about, um, where it's uh, local interactomes, where it's maybe 20, 30, 50 proteins. And uh, Rob Ewing, I guess, talked about maybe more of, of this type of data or somewhere in, in, in between this, I would say. Uh, well, I guess in, it's, it's really medium scale. Um, but what I want to say again is that uh, we need a different computational approach in each case. And a lot of papers that are published, they're really published on this global interactomes where you can utilize the topology of the network, um, um, which is a very different approach where you have really a lot of proteins and each protein is profiled in multiple replicates. Um, and each protein that appears in the network is used as a bait itself. Then you can utilize the methods that were developed for um, East um, True Hybrid and East uh, Global IPMS studies. But in our experience, none of those methods really apply to medium or small scale studies. So, um, so the problem I already mentioned here, the two components in this, and when we talk about now false positives in the context of protein interactions, again, the protein interactions can be a false positive interactions because we identify the protein incorrectly, right? And that's why this improved methods for estimation of error rates at the protein level are important, which I talked in the first part. But also it could be a, a non-specific um, binding versus real interaction problem that was mentioned before by the speakers. So in the remaining of this presentation, I'll talk about this part here. And again, briefly mentioned existing methods for eliminating contaminants, uh, non-specific binders. So the methods that are uh, the simplest ones are based on uh, frequency counts. Uh, 
simply saying, well, we have a matrix of, um, uh, um, and usually like with is to hybrid, it would be, or um, APMS global studies, it would be a, a binary matrix where one means that uh, a particular prey was identified in a pull down experiment with this particular bait and zero means it wasn't identified. So obviously something that appears across many different baits uh, um, is a suspect because it's likely a non-specific binding that's going on there. And those can be simply counted and eliminated by uh, applying a frequency cutoff say of 5%. Um, I also mentioned the social affinity scores. Uh, I believe they were introduced um, uh, maybe um, Gary Bader, who is here, was one of the first people who uh, introduced uh, or applied them in, in this context here. And the related methods uh, that are relying on the topological features, uh, such as more advanced purification enrichment scores and other methods. Again, there are many of them. Um, they basically designed for global studies where, like I said, um, um, pretty much every protein that appears as a prey here is also a bait in that matrix. So it's a kind of a more or less a symmetric uh, matrix that's required in those cases. Um, they require multiple replicates per bait um, and really work lar well with uh, large protein complexes where a lot of proteins pull out each other and not at all for uh, signaling um, uh, pathways like, like the kind of data. So what can we do then if you have small scale studies or um, or signaling networks where this topology based uh, methods not don't work and I I put this here because this is the slide that I used at the HUPO presentation where uh, Mike Washburn was in the room, but I know that there are a lot of people that really attack this label frequentification, uh, although much less now. Um, and I got a few comments from before, you know, why would you even use spectral counting when isotopic uh, labeling based methods are so much better. And I would always say that, uh, you know, go and argue with Mike because he would really uh, like to argue with you about that, right? <laughs> So not, I, there is obviously no need to do it today because it was already covered and the utility of spectral counts nicely demonstrated by him and others. But um, there is a value in this approach. And if you work with small scale networks and cannot use isotopic labeling because of it's already large enough that's cost prohibitive, um, I really, that's all you have is a label frequentification based on spectral counts. And that's what we are using as well in the case of this Kinom study. That's why we developed the, the method for um, statistical analysis of, uh, of interacting networks, interaction networks. We call it SAINT, statistical analysis of interactomes. Where the idea is that you want to do it better than just simple filtering thresholds. Um, so uh, Mike Washburn has his method of doing that and we're now comparing with his method. But what we are doing is, um, uh, different, it, it, it's maybe more uh, statistics heavy. Uh, but again, the idea is that um, we utilize spectral counts instead of just one and zero. And for each bait, uh, say we have a prey and we have a 55 counts. And basically, again, the setup is simple. We want to know the 55 counts, what probability does it translate into, right? Um, so the method that we have models, so unlike uh, some of the assumptions in the Mike uh, Washburn's method, we kind of model it across the entire row of numbers for each prey kind of and for each bait. Uh, we model the data set using um, um, a Bayesian statistical model um, and convert this number into the probability. So this probability for this 55 counts depends not only on the 55 counts itself, but also on uh, what are the numbers we have for other purifications where this prey was identified, as well as for what are the other numbers that you see for other proteins in that particular purification. So it's a hierarchical Bayesian model that uh, models across rows and, and columns. Um, so we think it has certain advantages, but really I would not have time to go too much into detail of this, but. So you guys are not using any controlled purifications in these calculations? In this, well, I'll get back to that. So the question is, so when we start working with SAINT, we had to develop a model that would not use any controlled purifications or would only have a very small number of controlled purifications because in large scale studies, often collecting controlled purifications is uh, difficult. Um, um, especially sufficient number of, um, but from what I also understand in some cases, it's also technically not possible to get really good controls. So and this is all spectra for all peptides? Uh, this would be a spectral count in here, but actually we end up in the kinome study, uh, 
um, we end up using um, a peptide counts, unique peptide counts, but for other data sets, we're typically using spectral counts. Is it your question? No, no, I mean, are all of the spectra from all of the peptides represented in that one number? Yes, in this number would be uh, right. But, but what I was saying that sometimes instead of using the total spectra, like all spectra for all peptides, we would either just count how many unique peptides we have regardless of how many spectra we identified for each peptide. Or like I get back to that very quickly, um, when we have peptides shared across several proteins, we have to do something else. So, but that's a, just an illustration here that we can assume that all spectra are used. So the kind of the basic assumption in the model, again, without going too much into details, is that we utilize a Poisson model for spectral count data. So we basically make an assumption that, and that's a good one actually, that um, a spectral count or a peptide count follows the Poisson distribution that reflects its abundance. Uh, the spectra are normalized. That's not too much different from what uh, Mike is doing, except that in addition to the length normalization, we also have additional normalization parameters such as the bait coverage by how many spectra of the bait was identified, or the peptide atlas, which is kind of what is the abundance of the protein in a cell prior to affinity purification, kind of average abundance of the protein. So there are more normalization factors that go into this equation. And in the case of the Kinom study, because we did not have controls, we really had to deal with two problems at the same time. One is detecting high abundance contaminants. And the second one is dealing with the low abundance counts. Um, and calling um, if interaction significant uh, is different, whether it's a, you know, if it's a high abundance contaminant, it's one case. But if it's a not a high abundance contaminant, but identified by one, one two, or three peptides of spectra, you know, we also have to make a call whether it's a significant interaction or not. So the model kind of tries to address both, both of those things, and we have a two-step kind of process here implemented. So for this kind of second step where we're assuming that uh, we can eliminate high abundance contaminants um, easily the first step, uh, then we again have a mixture modeling kind of similar to protein profit where given the spectral count, we convert it to a probability it's number between one and zero. Uh, that's the uh, true interacting partner of the bait. Uh, and we use Poisson distribution here um, and these parameters here in, in, in those distributions are estimated using this hierarchical Bayesian model, which um, um, it will be published as a supplementary materials um, as a part of the Kinom paper. But it extends our spectral counting model published in MCP last year in a way. So um, it kind of the, the procedure wise, it looks like this. So we take this uh, uh, data set spectral count matrix with spectral counts here and as well as sequence length of each prey and protein, pre-enrichment abundance of prey proteins based on protein, um, protein uh, uh, peptide atlas information, um, as well as the bait coverage, and use this hierarchical Bayesian mo modeling across all rows and columns and calculate the probability for each number. And another difference between us and Mike's method that our number can be one uh, because we do not require that uh, the probability is sum to one. So this is one uh, difference between Mike's method because he, he assumes that uh, all probabilities for each prey should sum up to one. We can discuss that offline later. Anyways, it does eliminate effectively the, most of the non-specific binders and, uh, and, and also low count noise uh, and calculates a score for each individual interactions without using network properties, topology properties. That's a key, again, key difference compared to Krogan and all other methods, um, and allows us to reconstruct those high uh, quality networks like East Kinom data that Uncloud talked about, and really eliminate a lot of false positives. This is a, a kinase uh, and its interacting partners or proteins that come down with that uh, before statistical modeling and kind of after statistical modeling, you see kind of there is a, you know, a full change reduction in the number of uh, proteins before and after filtering. And uh, let me skip this slide and then, uh, because of the timing. Uh, so now what are we are doing? So yes, the initial goal was to develop a model that does not require any negative controls. And certainly uh, we realized um, that you know, a lot of times there are a lot of negative controls that can be collected as a part of the study. And really it's a good practice to have those controls generated even if uh, it seems like an additional effort and additional costs. Um, 
So it's only, and, and also for small data sets, this kind of global method, well, the method that we have is not as global as the, the, the large scale network type of methods. But still, it requires a certain number of baits to really identify contaminants by modeling across the uh, multiple purifications. So if it's only 20 or less baits, that method would not work, um, the full empirical method that I described. Or if you have interconnected baits, then a lot of interacting partners are gonna just simply look like contaminants, right? So it's another method where there is, you know, if all baits are interconnected and share a lot of partners, there's you just, you cannot do anything unless you're utilize controls as a part of the statistical model to help you to decide what is contaminant or what is not. So same point version two now that we are working on does integrate negative controls, but not just in a simple way of doing some t-test, you know, looking at the counts and control versus counts in the experiment, uh, but again, combining with the same modeling, but utilizing control as a part of this modeling. Um, we also looking carefully at MS1 data as well. Um, and in our unpublished preliminary experience, actually spectral counting MS1 data uh, pretty much give the same um, ability to uh, eliminate false positives. Um, however, we do think that by integrating MS1 and spectral counting, you can do better than using one method alone. And the second part here that we're um, obviously, everybody who is working with this type of data aware of is again this isoform problem and how to deal with uh, label frequentification in the case of shared peptides. Um, I thought I have, a, I have a thing, a slide on that later. Now, on top of the additional, on top of the using negative controls, we also talking about and, and developing actually actively this contaminant repository for affinity purification. Because I think there is a, you know, it's one, it's great when you have controls and matching controls for your experiment, and that's probably the best. But a lot of times you, um, maybe don't have good controls or you have a small number of controls that's not sufficient just to rely on them. Um, so, and initially I was thinking that maybe one can just utilize control runs from previous experiments and not even do any controls. And I was quickly convinced, um, uh, I was uh, persuaded by biologists like uh, Unclode and, uh, and, and, and Mike that, that that's gonna be a really bad idea. Um, so it's great to build a repository of um, common contaminants from previous studies, but utilize it as a supplementary information um, in the process, but not just relying on the contaminant repository as the only way to remove contaminants. Um, although maybe one day the repository is gonna be very complete. Anyways, the idea here is that we can uh, uh, take studies like uh, typical studies where you use uh, your bait purification and the matching control and, and eliminate contaminants uh, by subtracting everything identified in controls, but we would take just this control data um, and people are more willing um, to share the control data rather than the uh, real experimental data and put it in a, in a, a repository that's built on top of the ProHeats database that um, Unclothes um, described and uh, uh, Rob Ewing's data was the, you know, the, the starting data sets that we had and uh, we uh, Robin and Claude were still working and discussing these different issues. But the idea is that by having this contaminant database, um, and that's all the slide, right now we have quite a lot of data collected here, including data from uh, Mike Washburn from Rudy Ibersold Lab and uh, some other um, uh, and Claude's data and, and um, other data sets. Uh, but um, if you have enough data, we can start, we already can do that. You can cluster this contaminant profiles across different experiments. But what's shown here is hierarchical clustering of the similarity between contaminant profiles between different control purifications, say, uh, from different studies. And you see how the gel-based um, uh, Rob Ewing's uh, study cluster together here, meaning that the proteins that were identified in those negative control runs were um, quite consistent across different uh, subsets of data. This is kind of a random splitting of uh, his large data sets into um, seven or eight subsets. Um, and say tandem affinity purification protocol from Rudyabersold lab and the recent method, they clustered together. Um, and flag purification from um, Unclothes lab, um, you know, there was a kind of a, a larger clustering here with different subclusters depending on the, on the protocol. So really what, what, what makes difference is obviously gel-based versus gel-free tech type, but also conditions on how you do the experiments. So by having this large data sets, we can actually um, 
kind of pinpoint these different sources of uh, contaminant proteins here. So um, uh, this is just one example where you can look at the proteins that were consistently identified, say, only in uh, gel-based um, um, Ewing uh, molecular systems biology publication, um, as shown here. And you see that a lot of these proteins are um, uh, uh, extremely abundant in these data sets, but actually not observed in uh, gel-free uh, methods. So there are some very interesting trends uh, that, that, that's kind of become apparent. So the practical utility of this is going to be as a quality control in addition to um, probability-based filtering, um, implementing um, experiment-specific negative controls, but as well as the methods to optimize FTMS conditions so we can eliminate these contaminants um, or maybe incorporate the database as a part of the statistical model itself when we uh, calculate the confidence in individual interactions. I have a few slides here where I was going to show uh, the spectral counting again are really sensitive to this isoform, um, isoform problem. And this is from a study that uh, the data was actually collected by Jeff Ranish here from a collaboration with Sir Gerald Crabtree Lab. Um, Lena Ho is the person who um, did these experiments. Um, the, the, I want to show this here is that um, in this study they compared a composition of protein of particular protein complex, this uh, buff chromatin remodeling complex across three different cell lines. Um, uh, embryonic stem cells, uh, uh, fibroblast, um, and, a, and, and, a, and a brain uh, cells. And what you see here is a quantitative, semi-quantitative immunoblot, and there are two proteins, homologous proteins, that are um, um, in a embryonic stem cells. This isoform, this protein, was um, really part of the complex and not the other one, uh, as obvious from this immunoblot. But if you look for this embryonic stem cell for these two proteins and the spectral counts, uh, you have 127 versus 534. So it's a 4 to 1 ratio versus 20 to 1 observed by the quantitative immunoblot. So what, uh, why is the spectral counts gives you uh, such a huge difference compared to uh, a quantitative immunoblot data? And the answer is, of course, because of the 62% homology. And we extended our protein profit method for apportioning peptides to do the same with spectral counts, and others are doing similar things, where we would count unique peptides first and then apportion shared peptides across um, its proteins when we do the spectral counting. So if, when we do the spectral counting carefully for these two homologous proteins, uh, from the initial ratio of uh, 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 4 to 1 that we had, we go to the ratio of 20 to 1 um, for the adjusted spectral count that matches perfectly what we see from the quantitative immune blood. So, um, so uh, this goes to illustrate that you know we have to go back and you know keep this in mind when we do um, all these steps here in a way. So finally, uh, this last part, I'm, I'm only going to have one slide just to mention that we are working on the improved um, clustering methods because again we think that the existing methods are not always utilized. The APMS information. Um, uh, they're not always developed specifically uh, for this type of data, so they uh, have certain problems. Uh, so the method that we develop can cluster both baits and prey, so it's a kind of a bi-clustering method. And it utilizes spectral counts, again, as a, as a measure of a protein abundance in the sample after affinity purification. And again, the main application of this clustering is not to large-scale networks, but to local networks, where um, by doing this by clustering, we basically assign, we not only cluster baits into complexes, into clusters, but we also, for each prey that can be participate in multiple complexes, we assign it to different abundance categories, uh, say high, medium, low abundance, or not identified. So we can easily detect um, attachments, proteins that are uh, participate in multiple clusters, multiple complexes, but at the different abundance levels. So we get a better idea of the kind of the stoichiometry uh, and in some way dynamics of complexes if the same method is applied in a, in a, in a context, kind of in a dynamics context. So, um, so in the summary, um, I think APMS and the label frequentification allows developing us more advanced statistical methods. Um, I think there is a room, a lot of room for computational work here in this area. And the same method is one of the methods for computing confidence in individual interactions that I presented very briefly. And it's not a topology-based method developed for large-scale studies. Contaminant repositories, I think, are going to be extremely useful 
um, for quality control and additional data mining, label frequentification um, with advanced clustering allows um, identifying protein complexes uh, more efficiently. And I think there is a great need, which I didn't talk about, but there is a really great need for an experimental benchmark data set. So we can go back and um, really benchmark some of these methods, which is right now kind of quite hard. So I'll stop here and uh, acknowledge uh, people in my lab, mostly it's Hyun Won Choi, who did a lot of work here, and um, uh, and Claude uh, Jean Gras lab, and Mike Tyrick's lab, and Kainom study. Um, certainly Jeff Radner should be added here as a, um, at the Institute for Systems Biology lab. Um, I show some of the data he generated. And then Case Western University, Rob Ewing here, involved in contaminant project. Um, and Mike, he always gives us data. We're really grateful uh, to him for that. Um, so thank you. I have a question about uh, matching peptides to proteins. Uh, you said you are using Occam's reason principle, but you said it's a probabilistic approach. Yes. But in general, in, in these types of problems, there are two computing approaches. Maximum parsimony, mm -hmm. which is deterministic Occam's reason, and maximum likelihood, which is probabilistic. Are you using a hybrid? Uh, um, well, I guess, uh, let, let me say in a little bit different way what I did, and maybe it will address your question again. It's the, the method of parsimony here um, is basically saying that um, each peptide, um, we, we, we have a weight on each edge connecting a peptide, a protein. So a peptide can come from several proteins, and we assign a weight on each edge, and we require that the weights sum to one. So that's one uh, kind of uh, indication of this parsimony method in the model. Um, and the second one that at the end, um, right, so at the end when we do this, if the protein can explain the peptide and that peptide is also in, in another protein but doesn't have any independent evidence, the weight that connects the peptide and the protein is going to be one for the first protein and zero for the second one. So it effectively will eliminate the second protein and give us the, this um, parsimonious solution. I don't know if it addresses yeah, your question. So these are still the early days in interaction studies and some of the popular methods that have been addressed here are flag tap type studies that are done in one cell line 293, easily transfectable. But the way I see in the future is that it's the environment of the cell that will decide many of these proteins are not even present in 293 cells or at very low abundance, that it will be done in different cell lines and then they are going to be done in response to different situations. Many of these are looking at only the basal interactome and not that is induced by a given situation. And a lot of the research that you are doing actually does not address some of those issues that will uh, bring in cell type specific contaminants. How are you going to deal with those future situations? We are not there yet, but I think five years will be there. Right, well, my, my, my group, we are, we are very much data driven, so we work with the data that's available now. I mean, there are some limited data sets using different cell lines, so Mike has, he provided us for, for example, for the contaminant database, we have HeLa cell line, I believe, um, um, you know, so there is a two cell lines represented in there, but yeah, sure, I mean, later you have to add all this complexity, but I think it's gonna be um, experiment driven, the type of data that um, I'm gonna see the computational, um, a biologist, so we'll see what kind of questions you know we'll have to deal with when you have this type of data. We structure the data by by cell line and also by method of purification and so on. So the way I mean we're ready to to accept these kinds of data whenever they are generated. And clearly, my lab is generating some, but not all of them. But and also the method, because you change the exactly. detergent, exactly. suddenly your contaminants are different. Right, but again, yeah. like. Yeah. then your contaminants are different. So yeah. Yeah. there are many levels of complexity. That's why I said that contaminant database is not going to be something that it, doesn't, it should not replace experiment specific, but it is a great help on top of the experiment specific control runs. Until you put all the data together, you don't actually know what the important variables are. You know, well, you mean, we have some idea, but this will really enable us to pin down what those important variables are. Um, you mentioned that a Poisson distribution for your spectral count was uh, appropriate to determine the mm -hmm. abundance of the proteins. Um, that's my first, could you explain that? Well, not to determine the abundance of the protein, but the model, the expectation of how many, you know, given a certain abundance, um, how many spectra you would expect to see for that protein. And that can follow a Poisson distribution that's centered around a mean um, abundance 
uh, factor for that protein that's kind of roughly correlate, you know, that that's a, re represents the abundance of the protein in the sample. Have you thought about using some parametric bootstrapping methods? Well, it? yes. Yeah. So we, we are, for example, for MS1 data, we'll be using um, uh, non non parametric methods because we don't think we can. If you instead of spectral counts have MS1 ion current based quantification, we're not sure what kind of distribution you're going to see. So we are prepared to use non parametric methods which always are more pain than parametric methods like Poisson. So when you can avoid them, that's great. The last one, I think you showed the ratio between um, your new method using the peptide property to determine the ratio between two cases of a protein. And I think you showed that your ratio was more accurate to the ratio found. Using right, the spectral time. counting, you mean. Right, OK. When you do sort of extend this algorithm, how do you, um, how are you going to sort of identify the significance of change? Uh, between one state versus the other because ratios are obviously not very accurate. Right, exactly. So significant of change. Uh, we have a model. We worked this out for um, f just for differential expression set up in the context of spectral counts. In the context of protein complexes, um, the significance of change comes from those. You, you could come up with, a, with, again, with a model that could, uh, like a mixture modeling based approach um, that would convert the, the ratio between protein abundance in complex A versus complex B into probability that's in, enriched kind of in complex A versus complex B. But um, yeah, that's a work in progress, but it's a good question.